Good evening and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. I'm Virginia Prescott from GPB and your host for these talks. Tonight I am talking with Jonathan Alter about his very best, Jimmy Carter, A Life. You can purchase the book directly from Acapella Books. There's a link in the chat segment of your screen. There's also a link at the Atlanta History website, Center's website. And Alter's book covers the arc of Carter's life from the barefoot boy on a farm in Sumter County, Georgia, to the governor's mansion, to the White House, and his eventful life in the 40 years since he lost re-election. The good works of those latter years are popularly considered to have redeemed his reputation. Alter argues that Carter was a, quote, surprisingly consequential president, a political and stylistic failure, but a substantive and far-sighted success. We're gonna talk with him about his consequential book and invite your questions. You can type them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and please keep them brief and in the form of a question. And I will try to integrate as many into the conversation as possible. Jonathan Alter is an award-winning author, political analyst, columnist, television producer, and a radio host. His New York Times best-selling books include two books on President Obama, the Center Holds, Obama and His Enemies, and The Promise, President Obama, Year One, along with The Defining Moment, FDR's 100 Days and the Triumph of Hope. Alter is also former senior editor of Newsweek. He's a contributing correspondent for NBC News and MSNBC and co-producer and co-director of the Emmy-winning HBO documentary, Breslin and Hamill, Deadline Artists. Jonathan Alter, pleasure to have you back to Atlanta, at least virtually tonight. <laughs> Great to be here, Virginia. Thanks for having me. Your book does defy that popular narrative of Carter as a failed president, but the best ex-president ever. But you give him a lot more credit and call him perhaps the most misunderstood president in American history. We will definitely want to get into the particulars, but what do you think history gets wrong about Jimmy Carter? Well, um, you know, history so far has judged him uh, as a politician. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he was not a very good politician. Rosalind Carter, uh, by both of their accounts, is a much better politician. And he made a number of political mistakes uh, and he was defeated for re-election. And history likes winners, you know? And so if you, if you lose, um, then uh, you're succeeded by, you know, the great communicator, Ronald Reagan, uh, who understood the theater of the American presidency in a way that Carter did not. Uh, you're not going to look very good in, in history. And, and also the, the economic condition of the country was not good at the time of the 1980 election. And, and people tend to remember that and, and hold Carter accountable for that. We can talk about why that's not fair. Uh, you know, later on, if you want to, but so so he was judged harshly uh, initially by history, but now I think there's a reassessment underway, and history should judge presidents not just by how popular they were, but by what they accomplished, the points they put on the board, how they were looking out for the future of the country. And on that score, whether it's, you know, uh, 15 major pieces of environmental uh, and energy legislation, uh, or uh, which included, you know, uh, uh, the first clean energy uh, funding, uh, thinking about climate change 30 years before others did, um, to major foreign policy accomplishments that we can get into. Um, you know, the record is surprisingly good and, and he, he got a lot done that just got swept aside by history. Well, let's talk about setting the foundation, which you do in the book of his early years in Archery, Georgia, not far from Plains on a farm, no electricity, no running water, something you really compared to a 19th century existence. What, what was life like for young Jimmy Carter? Well, um, he was born, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1924, but it might as well have been in the 19th century. Uh, people think he's from Plains, and it's true he was born in Plains. He was the first president ever born in a hospital because they happened to have one there, very unusual for 
a small town in Southwest Georgia, but he was raised a few miles outside of Plains in archery on a farm. And, um, you know, it was a basically a feudal system with tenant farmers and sharecroppers who were African-American and, and it was really just one step up from slavery. And what fascinated me was the, um, really the, the nature of, of Jim Crow life uh, that extended from his, you know, his childhood in, in the 20s and 30s um, uh, all the way through the 1950s and into the 1960s. So he's, he's living in a world that is pretty unimaginable to us. So for instance, he could play his best friend was a, a black kid named A.D., uh, Alonzo Davis. And when they were little, they could they could play together, you know, and it was no problem. And uh, A.D. could come in the house and do anything. Uh, couldn't use the outhouse. Uh, that was only for white people in the same way that, you know, whites only in the public uh, laboratories. Uh, so if you were black, as as Carter later wrote, you'd have to go in the in the bushes, you know, in uh, in the trees uh, to relieve yourself. And um, when he got older, he couldn't come in the house at all. A.D. couldn't. Uh, and Carter realized this and later wrote a, a, actually a wonderful poem about it, <laughs> because Jimmy Carter is like an engineer with a humanist struggling to get out. And he had a book of poetry that he did. And one of the best poems in the book, not all the poems are good, but one of the best ones is called The Pasture Gate. And it, it, it describes a moment in his life when he and A.D. are about 12 or 13 and um, they approach the pasture gate and A.D. opens it for him, for Jimmy to go through. And at first, Jimmy thought it was a trick, that there was a booby trap there or some kind of practical joke or something because they had wrestled and boxed and, you know, been basically equals. But A.D.'s uh, mother or aunt had told him, no, now you have to treat him as your superior. You, are, you, you have to open the gate so that, uh, you know, Master Jimmy can go through. Now... After that, A.D. said to Jimmy, I'm not going to call you, they didn't call him Master Jimmy, it would, I'm not going to call you Mr. Jimmy. As you know, in the South, you know, that's a, 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 an honorific, mostly used for white people. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm not going to call you that. And Jimmy said, I don't want you to call me that. But that gives you some idea of what life was like there. And... Um, just one other example, uh, there was a governor of Georgia named uh, Eugene Talmadge. Uh, his son, Herman Talmadge, was a senator from Georgia, in, you know, into the uh, 1970s, in eight, or I think he lost in 1980 when Carter lost for re-election. Um, and Gene Talmadge, the wild man of Sugar Creek, was one of the most virulently racist governors, not just of Georgia, but of any state. And that is saying something. Uh, it was beyond belief what he would say at his rallies. Uh, and, um, you know, he'd say, uh, for instance, the, the, uh, the working man of Georgia has three friends, Jesus Christ, the Sears Roebuck catalog, and old Gene Talmadge, me. Right. And they'd say, and the working man of Georgia has three enemies, ends, ends, ends. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Carter went with his father to this governor's rallies when he was a, a little boy. His father was a big fan of Gene Talmadge. Um, so and his mother, on the other hand, was a nurse who treated black patients for free, uh, Lillian Carter, who <clears throat> Some people may remember, uh, used to go on Johnny Carson a lot when her son was president because she was such an entertaining character. So he had this sort of duality in his life, uh, white supremacist father, mother with 
for the times, relatively speaking, enlightened views on race. She later joined the Peace Corps when she was 68 years old. And then there was a third parent, uh, an illiterate black woman farmhand named Rachel Clark, who Carter said gave him a lot of his love of nature and his faith. So she was extraordinarily important. In many ways, he was raised uh, by uh, a black woman. Yeah. So a uh, kind of mixed signals. His father was a white supremacist. Talmadge, by the way, there's a bridge named for him uh, in, in Savannah, uh, among other things, schools, etc. But his, his mother had, let's say she was a, not quite an integrationist, but maybe segregation light. You know, she didn't let yeah. uh, people of color through her front door. Yeah. Certainly. <laughs> Right. But 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 this is you know this is you, you quote Gary Will saying this is in a mean and starved corner of America, and and Jimmy on the one hand when he was an adult refused to join the White Citizens Council that enforced racist norms, but he ducked the civil rights movement during his roles in in town government and later in state governance. And you don't give him a pass on that, but you do portray a man who bowed to the white supremacy supremacy of his context. Was that was that just political for him? What what was going on for Jimmy Carter, do you think? Well, uh, it depends what time we're talking about. So in the 1950s, um, before he goes into politics, he's elected to the Georgia State Senate in 1962. Uh, a lot of it was uh, just survival. Um, you know, if uh, he and his family, his immediate family, Rosalind and their children were, they were, Rosalind told me at one point that you could count on one hand the number of liberal people in, in Sumter County who were for integration, which they had, you know, become in favor of when Jimmy was in the Navy and Truman had desegregated the armed forces and Jimmy, who already what you know was he, there's nothing, there's no record of him ever saying anything racist, ever. You know, even when he was a kid. Um, so he already was disposed this way. But then, when his father died and he had to take over his father's business, the farm supply business, uh, there was basically you know white terrorism mm -hmm. in in Southwest Georgia. So if you uh, you know, did business with a, um, in this case, uh, it was a, uh, an interracial farm very close to Plains called Koinonia. And it was being boycotted by, by everybody in the area because blacks and whites were living together. The guy who ran it was a mentor to Martin Luther King, who said he was scared to go to this farm because the Klan shot it up so often. But Carter observed the boycott of this farm. And at first I'm thinking, why, why wouldn't he sell to this farm? You know, he, he wasn't a prejudiced person. And the answer is that another business did not obey the boycott and it was dynamited, a white business. So, you know, you were, he was already called an end lover uh, if he had kind of raised his head and tried to, say, enforce Brown versus Board of Education when he was uh, chairman of the Sumter County School Board. I mean, it wasn't even an issue. I looked in the minutes of the school board. Brown versus Board of Education wasn't even discussed. You know, it just there was no question that they were going to defy that Supreme Court order. And in part because the Georgia uh, legislature had passed a law saying that if even one black kid went into a white school, the school must under Georgia law close. And and the, there was a governor of Georgia in that period whose slogan was no, not one, not one black kid in a white school. So this was the environment that he was uh, uh, living in as a young man. And, and um, so initially it was fear. Uh, later, there was some political expediency when he runs for governor the second time um, and he's running against a former governor, Carl Sanders, who has all the support from the Atlanta area. And Carter has to carry the rural conservative vote, um, the, you know, the racist vote. And and 
So he sends some signals. He says, you know, I, I like George Wallace. I want him to come here and speak to the legislature, which he never did. And I, uh, you know, he goes and meets with the founder of the White Citizens Council publicly, sending a signal, kind of a dog whistle. Mm -hmm. And he gets elected. Um, but then from the first moment he's governor of Georgia, and we can, you know, we can talk more about this. He says the time for racial discrimination is over and he spends the second half of his life making up for what he didn't do, standing up to racial discrimination in the first half of his life. Yes. And that shows that we can all be redeemed. We all have time, you know, post George Floyd, you know, we have time to get this right. It's never too late to have that kind of reckoning that Jimmy Carter had uh, when he was in his 40s. Yeah, that is just a fascinating thing. He just completely flips the script in his inauguration speech and you know the crowd just goes completely silent and in shock. But you pressed him on that, right? That you you asked about that 1970 race for the governor, uh, 66, 70 rather, race for the yeah. governor, 66, he didn't win 70, he did by shifting to the right, I think, uh, yeah. admittedly. He didn't say anything explicitly racist, but he figured out how to appeal to racist voters, that, a decision that he claimed not to regret. And you did press him on that. What was his response to that? Um, you know, he said, um, he said, look, um, effectively said, I could denounce segregation or I could be governor of Georgia. And I chose to be governor of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And he said to, Vernon Jordan, who died recently, who uh, I interviewed, um, he said to him during that campaign, watch what I do, not what I'm saying. Watch what I do after I'm governor. And after he became governor, he basically integrated Georgia state government and, and uh, put up Martin Luther King's portrait in the Georgia state capitol and a lot of other things we can talk about. But, but so he, um, he was um, doing what, you know, um, a lot of politicians do, uh, mm -hmm. trimming his sails and tacking for political advantage. And um, as a candidate, I said earlier he was a bad politician. I meant that as president and as governor, actually, also. Mm -hmm. He thought that when you got in, you were supposed to do the right thing and not worry so much about the politics. But when he was campaigning, whether for governor or president, he would always do the political thing. And he would often do it very effectively uh, because, you know, he came from nowhere to get elected both governor and president. Um, and so and there's a lot of interesting stories behind that. But I, I think that he, um, despite not being willing to renounce what he did in that campaign, I don't think I know that he's not proud of it because at, at the end of that conversation, not quite the end. Uh, he said, um, quietly, not defensively, softly, are we done talking about this yet? <laughs> and I said, not yet, President Carter, <laughs> not quite yet. I have a few more questions on this 1970 campaign. Well, you raised a bunch of things. Um, uh, one, one also that was extremely moving about after he got into the governor's office, that Daddy King came into the governor's office and, and cried. It was the first time after all these years of being active in Atlanta that he was invited into the governor's office, which I found so moving. You also mentioned Koinonia, which was fascinating to me. And we have a question here from Bill and Mary. Did Jimmy Carter have contacts with Clarence Jordan and the Koinonia community? So this was something that uh, I spent a lot of time trying to track down. And the answer is very limited contacts. Uh, as I mentioned, he observed the boycott. And uh, he said that, uh, you know, he'd see uh, Clarence Jordan, Hamilton Jordan's uncle, interestingly, Hamilton Jordan became Carter's top aide years later. Um, and uh, he'd see him in town in Americus every so often, um, but he didn't go to Koinonia um, when Clarence Jordan was alive. In later years, of course, it became, you know, uh, uh, not just fine to go there, but it evolved into Habitat for Humanity. And we know that 
Carter, you know, was very associated with that and did a lot to put Habitat on the map. But at the time, before it was Habitat, before, Millard Fuller, the founder of Habitat, was uh, a, a wealthy businessman who wanted to go to this interracial, spiritual far, Christian farm. And um, when, at the time, Clarence Jordan was alive and he died of a heart attack in 19. 19- 69 and this give you some indication the uh coroner wouldn't go to Coinidia because basically no white people in the area would go there uh and um so M- millard fuller the f- soon to be founder of habitat had to put his body into station wagon to, to take it to the morgue rosalind carter however and uh lillian carter did on occasion go there uh, and um, they uh, knew Clarence Jordan and his wife um, better than Jimmy did. And in later years, Billy Carter, when he was running Carter's Warehouse after, after Jimmy went into politics, he sold uh, at a time when a lot of other white businesses wouldn't. Despite some later racism on Billy's part, uh, he um, sold uh, uh you know, supplies and uh, from the warehouse. He did business with the farm from Carter's Carter's warehouse in Plains. Um, but um, this was something where I had to peel back the layers because this again is a, a chapter in Carter's career that he's, he's not proud of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, he did uh, observe the boycott. There were times when he, um, so this, this story really uh, just, gave me a real sense of uh, what was going on at that time. So there was a, 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 a resident of Koinonia who had actually, I think he just left the farm, but he was associated with it, a, a white Navy veteran like Carter, also gone to the Naval Academy, and was completely ostracized for having been part of this interracial farm. Um, and his son got cancer and who was treated uh, being treated at Sloan Kettering, famous cancer hospital in New York, where I was treated in 2004. Um, and his son is is dying of leukemia in, in Sloan Kettering, young, a boy. And um, there weren't telephones um, in very many places, and there wasn't one at the farm. So they would go to a little convenience store in town in Plains. It was run by a woman. And this uh, man would use, uh, or perhaps it was that he didn't have a phone on his farm. I'm not sure about Quirinia. He didn't have a phone. So he'd go and use the pay phone at this drugstore. Um, And the sheriff, the evil sheriff of Sumter County, Sheriff Fred Chappell, whose son became an important and revered figure in the artistic community in in, uh, Atlanta and should not be, uh, theater director should not be at all blame for the sins of his father, but his father made Bull Connor look like a nice guy. So he goes to the owner of this drugstore and says, don't let him use the phone. <laughs> don't let him use the phone to call Sloan Kettering and find out how his son is doing. And uh, so the Carters really objected to that and they made sure that he was able to use the phone. And then when um, uh, the boy died and uh, uh, the um, the minister of uh, the racist Baptist church, and there's a story about the Carters eventually leaving that church, would not go out to, uh, um, you know, pay his respects and say a prayer for this boy. And Rosalind Carter went to him and said, this is outrageous. Get out to that boy's grave. And um, so, you know, they they knew the right thing. They sometimes did the right thing, but they were scared. On some level, they were scared. And so I asked, there was a, uh, there's a, still alive, a guy named Warren Fortson, who uh, was in the papers a lot in the 60s because he was the county attorney in Sumter County. And he was, you know, Tom Brokaw interviewed him for WSB and, uh, he was in the New York Times because he was standing up for enforcing the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and he was driven out of town. They made up lies about him. 
uh, and uh, they said he'd had an affair with a black woman and made up a whole bunch of other stuff. And he could no longer live in the community. And he left. And I interviewed him a couple of years ago. And I said, well, you know, you stood up more than Jimmy Carter did. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter wouldn't talk to the press. You know, he'd lock the screen door when the New York Times came around to ask him about civil rights movement. He was the state senator from the district, not standing up for the right thing. And he said, you know, I could practice law at a lot of places. And I did. I could leave easily. My profession was mobile. He had a business there. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if he had done the right thing, it would have been the end of his livelihood. And they actually did at one point boycott Carter's business because he went on vacation in 1965 with his family to Mexico and some of his enemies in the John Birch Society made up a, a story that he'd gone to a communist training camp uh, for civil rights workers. And when he got back, he'd lost all his customers. He had to go to them and tell them, you know, this isn't true. Uh, but that's the sort of thing he had to put up with for many years. Well, you talked about Rosalind's example of courage, speaking to in a very direct way to that pastor. She uh, is a savvy, energetic campaigner and advisor played a decisive role in his political life. And it sounds like it was a real equitable partnership. Is that accurate throughout the marriage? Uh, not throughout the marriage, but it became uh, um, really the closest partnership um, in, in American history uh, because, uh, you know, she and he revolutionized the role of first lady. Uh, she was the first first lady to have uh, you know, a real office in the East Wing. She, I think people know she sat in on cabinet meetings. She was a diplomat. She uh, got a ma major mental health legislation enacted. She was partially responsible for convincing, um, she traveled all around the country convincing states to require vaccinations before kids could go to school, uh, something that resonates now and many, many other things. Um, but earlier in their marriage, and Jimmy speaks and writes very candidly about this, um, he um, did not treat her that way. He, he knew she was formidable. She was helping him build his business. She um, started out keeping the books and then became his full partner. Many of the ideas for expanding their quite successful agribusiness were her ideas. But um, for instance, when he left the Navy, uh, she loved his being in the Navy. She wanted to get out of planes. She, he, they met 93 years ago after Jimmy's mother delivered her and brought her two and a half year old over to see the new baby. And they are going to celebrate their 75th wedding anniversary in June. Um, which I, I just heard uh, from somebody who just saw them last week. They're very focused on, on that anniversary, right, as we speak. Um, but when he left the Navy, he didn't even tell her he had decided to leave the Navy. And he made the decision unilaterally. And on the drive from Schenectady, New York, he was working in this very exciting program, Admiral Rick over his nuclear Navy the most exciting technological project of the middle part of the 20th century. And he leaves because he has to, to rescue his family business. And, and uh, the whole way from Schenectady to Plains, she basically gives him the silent treatment. And she says to their, um, you know, their five-year-old, uh, Jack, uh, tell your father we need to stop at a rest stop, you know. <laughs> That kind of thing. And she admitted to me that she was depressed and angry for the first year they were back in Plains. And then again, in 1962, he decides to run for the state Senate without telling her, without consulting her. After that, he realized that he would consult her on everything. And he did. And they had an extraordinary partnership. And Time magazine reported uh, it, when he was president uh, that when there was a crisis, he would say to his secretary, get me Rosalind Sy, that was Sy Vance, the secretary of state, Zbig, the national security advisor, Ham, the chief of staff, 
And Hugh Sidey in Time Magazine said, note the order. <laughs> she was his first, the first person he consulted on every major decision. And, and, uh, and if you look at the record, and it just really was ridiculous that when CNN did this British made documentary on first ladies, they, they, they didn't include her. She was way more influential than either Eleanor Roosevelt or Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. because she had a much closer relationship with her husband. Another interesting fact, when they did move back to Plains, they lived in public housing, making him the first US president ever to live in public housing. There are so much richness in this book, in this big, thick and, and comprehensive book. But I want to go back to him as governor, um, you know, made some really bold moves, significant improvements in roads and highways. He stopped dam projects that were big money behind them, Army Corps of Engineers, so stood up to that, which saved the Chattahoochee River and other rivers. But he was also a real penny pincher. He put Chevy Novas in the state fleet. <laughs> he made his troopers drive 55 miles an hour. So sounds like a highly principled, but but kind of comes off as a little bit of a pill in 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 some ways. And and you you do this portrait of a man with great even prescient vision and moral courage, but also stubborn and sanctimonious and and rigid in many ways, prone to oversharing. So yeah. what, are, what are examples of the ways that that the Jimmy Carter's personality just gets in conflict with itself or gets in his own way? Um, so what fascinated me for through five years of research is the complexity of this man and the layered quality. And sometimes you see you get the pill and sometimes you get the the Zen Jimmy Carter. And uh, as Bigny Brzezinski, who I interviewed not long before he died, you know, told me that Carter had three smiles. There was the big one that they do the cartoons of and big public smile, uh, which was sort of a political smile. And um, then there would be the tight lipped smile when he would be glaring at you with those icy blues and you knew you were in trouble, you know, and the temperature in the room went down 20 degrees, you know, frosty. Uh, and then there was the genuine smile when somebody got off a funny remark, or sometimes I think people assume that, you know, he was this pious, you know, doer guy with no sense of humor. Not true at all. Uh, he sometimes could have a very dry and witty sense of humor. Um, but he, um, the, it was, uh, they said that, uh, you know, um, you think you know, Jimmy Carter, when you meet him, because uh, he makes such a good presentation, especially in small groups, was not effective on television, but in small groups was unbelievably persuasive, charming and effective and made him a great retail campaigner. But you really don't know him. And even people who worked for him for a long time couldn't get his number. And this is why sometimes people say, well, you've written the definitive biography of Jimmy Carter, I say, no, you know, it, it's not definitive. It's, it's, it, you can't be definitive about this man. He's too complicated. And, um, but I think, um, you know, uh, I've, been, uh, I've been talking a lot lately about Franklin Roosevelt because I wrote an article in the New York Times this yeah. week about Roosevelt and uh, Joe Biden. And uh, it was said of Roosevelt that he had uh, a second class intellect and a first class temperament. Mm -hmm. And and I think um, the same is true of Joe Biden. Second class intellect, these guys are not intellectuals. And a first class temperament, ability to get along with people, schmooze with people, connect to people uh, beyond just connecting with them to get their votes. And, and um, I think Jimmy Carter uh, has a first class intellect. He is astonishingly intelligent and a true Renaissance man, which we can get into, but arguably a second class temperament. You know, I looked at some of the logs of his calls with congressmen. They were so abrupt and chilly. And, you know, he'd sort of call him up, tell him what he wanted, hang up. You know, the call would last 30 seconds and he hated doing it. And he sold the Sequoia, this yacht that uh, presidents had had uh, for, for decades, 
which was a very effective lobbying tool. And he didn't, you know, he sold it. And uh, his idea of Al was being cooped up on a yacht with a congressman, you know, but that's part of the job. He got, as I said, he got a lot through, but in both in Georgia and in in Washington, your word is a good one. He could be a, a pill with people that he needed. And that was, in retrospect, not so smart. And I think he recognizes that. And he, you know, the challenge by Ted Kennedy for the nomination from the left in 1980, it, it didn't cause his defeat, but it contributed to his defeat in that election. Um, and I, when I asked him about his regrets, he said that he he should have done a better job building and nurturing relationships within the Democratic Party because president is the leader of the party. And uh, he didn't act like it a lot of the time and, and uh, was, uh, you know, stubborn and, and chilly more than he should have been. Even when he decided to run for president, uh, his mother Lillian said, "President of what? This would just <laughs> seem to come out of nowhere." Uh, and and Elizabeth asks, "What was the secret of how he managed to get elected president when he was probably at first thought of to be a weak possibility, especially in Georgia?" Yeah, he was at zero percent in the polls, um, and um, you know, as he admitted to me, if he had been allowed under the Georgia State Constitution to run for re-election in 1974, he would have lost. He had made some very tough decisions and he'd alienated a lot of powerful interests. And the, the, uh, the rural conservative uh, uh, racist vote, um, they felt he had betrayed them. And he... Uh, didn't really cozy up much to the Atlanta establishment. So he had alienated a lot of a lot of people. Um, but I, I think he. Um, uh, so I'm actually spacing on the exact nature of the question I want to give. She wants to know, like, why did he think that he could run for president? Oh, for president. He get a name okay. here in Georgia. So. Um, uh, certainly had the uh, Phil Walden was probably a good move for him to befriend because he yes. had Almond yes. Brothers, he had Charlie Daniels, yeah. you know, he had some real backing he, and credibility. He did, have, he did have some real friends. But so what, what happened was um, in uh, night, starting in 1972, his second year as governor, the, the candidates or possible candidates for president that year, these big time senators uh, came down and would often stay at the governor's mansion and Carter would take their measure. A lot of them he thought drank too much. That he didn't think they would be disciplined enough to be effective presidential candidates. Carter said, you know, I'm smarter than these guys, which he in some cases, what most cases was. And um, I know more about government because they're just voting in the Senate. They don't see where the rubber meets the road. It takes a governor to really see that. And um, I can close the gap in my knowledge on foreign policy, which he started to do by joining the Trilateral Commission and, and studying up. And so he thought, I can do this. And then Dean Rusk, who was Kennedy and Johnson's Secretary of State and uh, was uh, you know, the dean of the uh, University of Georgia Law School, he, Carter told me that when he told him that he should run for president, then, then he really started thinking about it seriously. And then his aides, Hamilton Jordan and Peter Bourne and others, Jerry Rafshoon, who was a great source for me on this book, they were urging him in 1972 to start planning. So they started four years before the 1976 election. He had done something similar when he ran a second time for governor of Georgia. He ran basically four years. He had been on Baptist missions going door to door in the North for, for Jesus. And when he came back from that in 1968, uh, he, you know, he was already running. In fact, he'd been running before those missions um, and before that born again experience. So, so he go, how did he do it? How did he go from zero in the polls to the democratic nomination? I think uh, he ran a brilliant tactical and strategic campaign. His, uh, opponents uh, split the vote. Um, so when he was running in New Hampshire and in Iowa, which he basically 
developed as an important caucus. Um, he would be, uh, you know, um, the only uh, conservative, you know, running against these Senate liberals. And then when he was running in, in the critical Florida primary against George Wallace, he was running from the left. And um, but the key thing is timing. Watergate. Nixon resigns in August of 1974. Carter is already quietly running for president. And at the end of the year, he announces his his uh, campaign just before he leaves the governorship. And and um, he's unemployed so he can campaign full time. All these other senators have to go back and vote. But Watergate created an opening for a candidate promising to tell the truth, a candidate with a moral message, uh, a candidate who was from outside of the squalor of Washington. And um, and it was a perfect meeting of man and moment mm -hmm. in in the 1976 campaign. But it's it was a miraculous campaign. And, and also, and this is why I put the Andy Warhol of him on the cover of my book. And you mentioned, you know, his friendship with these, the Allman Brothers and Charlie Daniels and Bob Dylan and these other musicians. He was cool. I mean, we forget because of the failures later. At the time he was running for president, he was he was quite cool and uh, a real breath, breath of fresh air. And I tell the story of how getting Hunter Thompson, mm -hmm. who was such a, you know, in our business, was like this gonzo icon, right? And he, in, in 1974, he went to the University of Georgia uh, Law School where Carter was giving what was turned out to be the best speech of his career and upstaged Ted Kennedy, who gave a lackluster speech that day. And uh, during earlier speeches, Hunter Thompson had been so bored that he'd go out to his car and get some wild turkey and refresh his iced tea, you know, with the wild turkey. And then he hears Carter's talking and Carter is attacking lawyers, attacking, attacking incarceration, many very current kinds of issues, mm -hmm. quoting Bob Dylan lyrics in his speech. And he goes out to his car and this time he gets a tape recorder. And he comes back and he tapes this speech. And then for the next two years, he's playing it, it to all these young journalists that, who he has great influence over. And they're going, wow, Hunter Thompson really loves this guy. He's writing these great stories about him in Rolling Stone. Maybe I should pay more attention to him. And then through some other skillful campaigning, he caught a wave in the in Iowa and, and started out strong out of the gate. He he staggered after that and almost almost lost the nomination. It was an it was a roller coaster ride, but he eventually got there. Yeah. And once he does, a uh, uh, great quote that you from Jody Powell that you put in the book, most presidents get a honeymoon period. Jimmy Carter didn't even get a one night stand. It right. was, it was right. tough going. Uh, that's great that you brought that up, Virginia, because um, I don't want to you know, get into a whole thing about his press coverage, but I argue that Watergate made him president mm -hmm. and unmade him because the post Watergate press corps was kind of all geared to get the president and distrust the president. Mm -hmm. And they sort of assumed, oh, this Carter's a fraud. You know, he can't really be, believe all this stuff. There has to be dirt on him. And, and um, you know, it turned out that he, he exaggerated a lot, but he really didn't lie. Mm -hmm. You know, there were no like five Pinocchio whoppers, you know, <laughs> in, in, on Jimmy Carter's uh, scorecard. And um, and the scandals that they thought they had, they didn't turn out to be anything. But he was besieged almost right from the start. Let's talk about some of his great accomplishments in office, the Camp David Accords, certainly. And this was a tremendous, tremendous risk. All of his team, or many in his team, were actually against it. It went on much longer than planned, almost fell apart several times as either Menachem Begin, just to be clear, uh, of Israel and Anwar Sadat, of Egypt, the, the people were threatening to pack their bags and get out of there. What did Jimmy Carter do to pull that off, which was truly historic? Um, this was a virtuoso diplomatic performance. He was warned by everybody, 
don't put your own credibility on the line. Have your secretary of state do it. And he goes, if, if I don't do it, it's not going to happen. He was quite right about that. Begin and Sadat both said that. Um, and he, it was um, uh, the attention to detail, which is often used as a criticism of Carter at Camp David and the Panama Canal Treaties, uh, uh, Alaska Lands Bill, which doubled the size of the national park system, a bunch of other things. The thing they criticize him for is what actually helped him. So he was, you know, way down in the weeds and just the level of persistence that it took because he found out on day one of Camp David that he couldn't have Begin and Sadat in the same room with each other. They had fought four wars. Israel and Egypt had fought four wars against each other since 1948. And you had guys sleeping in cabins right close to each other who had killed people in each other's families. So the level of hostility and bitterness was so great that what he had to do was, um, you know, work with each one of them and develop a, uh, a series of drafts of, of the agreement. And, you know, he ended up getting a deal between Israel and Egypt, but he did not get the settlement of the Palestinian question that he wanted and that he had hoped to achieve in his second term. Um, it almost fell apart, as you mentioned. It wasn't until uh, his secretary suggested that he bring over some signed photographs to Begin's cabin, um, signed to his grandchildren by name. And Begin started to cry when he saw these. And he said, okay, we'll come back one last try. Uh, but then the thing that, and, and you know, they, they had this agreement that is the most durable an important peace treaty since World War II. So when people talk about it, you know, uh, uh, and there hasn't been a shot fired in anger between them and, you know, in all the years since, when people talk about, oh, Carter, he didn't succeed as president, you know, the deal fell through. That's what I didn't even know or didn't remember. After Camp David, it fell apart again. It had fallen apart several times at Camp David. And in March of 1979, six months later, Carter had to go to the region, to Israel and Egypt, and put the whole thing back together again with, you know, masking tape and bailing wire. And, and the advisors again said, you're crazy. You know, this thing failed and it, you'll just get stuck with this. And he said, I'm doing it because he, he was willing to take these risks for, for peace that were rather extraordinary. And indeed he was, the first president since Thomas Jefferson, um, where there was no uh, uh, no combat on his watch. Yeah, and I think we see the seeds of what he did after his presidency in that right. and in his pursuit of peace. Um, just a, com a couple comments. I think we got to John's question, assessment of the impact of media coverage on public perception. Maybe we could go a little further with that. Also, Margie says, I remember Carter coming to Concord High School in New Hampshire shaking hands with students, introducing himself as the next president of the United States. Yeah, Must have yeah. had a great amount of self-confidence to get yes. into those early days. Yeah, yeah, from the time when he was at 0% in the polls, he was <laughs> always really confident and that was infectious. And he also knew, we were talking about uh, these rock concerts that are in this film, Rock and Roll President, that was on CNN, good film. Um, uh, so, you know, I had some tape from, a, a concert in Providence in late 1975. And uh, they used the, con the proceeds from the concert to help fund his campaign. But then he got, he got up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna say three things. My name is Jimmy Carter. I want your vote for president. I'm gonna be president. And ladies and gentlemen, the Allman Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and like all these thousands of people are going, are going crazy. He's like a politician. And he talked for 30 seconds, you know, we're voting for him. Um, and so he, he really did know how to uh, appeal to people. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 and his luck was good when he was running. Uh, when he became president, his luck took a decided turn for the worse, especially in 1979 and 80. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, 79, uh, it, by your chronicling of it, looks uh, second to 2020 as, as worst year ever in popular imagination, certainly. 
And we do uh, this great triumph at Camp David followed by the greatest failure, the response to the Shah of Iran uh, leaving office. Uh, you write everything Jimmy Carter was not, his response was undisciplined, ill-informed and disorganized. And, and it were, I, I was aware that Carter was pressured to accept the Shah in the US once he had stepped down. But you give us real insight into how concerted that campaign from cold warriors and from the emerging new right was. So how did this poll play into the hostage crisis, if you can help set that up? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an extraordinary adventure story. So, you know, think of the movie Argo. And that was just about a footnote. That was just about the the people who were the hostages who were taking refuge in the Canadian embassy. Um, but this is, um, you know, the, the larger story is even more dramatic. Uh, and um, essentially, um, you know, what happened is that, uh, you know, there were some, there were these big things going on in early 1979 when the Shah was forced to uh, leave the Peacock throne. Um, I mentioned putting the Camp David treaties back together, Deng Xiaoping arrives and we establish diplomatic relations with China, which occupied a lot of the president's time and is now the foundation of the global economy, that bilateral relationship. At that time, China had the GDP of a sub-Saharan African country. And look at China now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, this very big historic things, he thinks, Carter thinks that will be the thing he's longest remembered for. Uh, you have the human rights campaign, uh, human rights policy and everything with that, which was a really effective policy. They didn't know it at the time, but in ending the Cold War and turning Latin America and parts of Asia democratic. Uh, so these other things, the Panama Canal treaties, which prevented a war in Central America. So the president is preoccupied with this. The economy is cratering because of these of OPEC, and we, suddenly we have this gas crisis, and in in 1979, and and you know lines gas stations that don't have any gas, and Carter goes down into the 20s, and um, so before um, he lets the Shah in, before uh, Iran becomes a big problem, he's having a terrible 1979. That's the year he gives the so-called Malaise speech, even though he never used the word malaise, and uh, uh, the economy is is a mess. And then he's, through this whole period, he's under intense pressure from people like Henry Kissinger to let their friend, the Shah, into the United States. Be, uh, they didn't know he was sick yet. Just let him in because he's been such a good ally, and Carter won't do it. He realizes we should not do that. And he, he actually, at one point, you wouldn't think Jimmy Carter would say this. He says, F the Shah. Mm. And I asked Harold Brown not long before he died, he was the defense secretary. Did he really say that? He goes, yeah, I was sitting right there. I couldn't believe Jimmy Carter was using that kind of language. Um, but then what happens is the Rockefeller people who were pressuring him to let the Shah in, and they were they had a young man from the Rockefeller office who was the Shah's closest companion. He's going from country to country and he's in Mexico and he gets sick. And the Rockefellers tell uh, the State Department and the White House that um, he must be treated in the United States or he's gonna die. And this is a lie that they told. And I get to the bottom of this lie, I think for the first time. Um, and, um, but it works. And Carter um, is told by Hamilton Jordan, look, first they're blaming you for the Shah losing his throne. Now they're going to blame you for killing him. So it, Carter lets him on a humanitarian basis, come in and be treated in New York. And uh, it was the worst decision of his presidency, because just a few days later, student militants seized the hostages at the US Embassy in Tehran. And they they were there for 444 days until just moments after Ronald Reagan took the oath. Well, yeah, I, this is something that we, we all know how this ends, but it, when you write it, it's a very suspenseful chronicle of the embassy being breached and overrun at the, the back and forth with what's going on in Washington. 
There are a number of theories and suspicions that the Reagan campaign traded arms with Iran to, to slow the roll or at least to prevent an October surprise at the, of the hostages being released in October, which probably could have thrown the election or certainly a, a lot of popularity to Jimmy Carter. You don't spend a whole lot of time on this and I know that there are many books, articles that have dug into it, but what, what did you find? So, um, you know, I went in as more of a skeptic, uh, in part because when I was at Newsweek, there was a big effort to debunk a lot of these conspiracy theories mm -hmm. that we published. And I thought some of them were ridiculous on their face. For instance, one of the theories is that George Bush, who was Ronald Reagan's running mate, went to uh, Paris, you know, in the middle of the fall campaign to talk to Iranians. And, you know, that's just not true in a million different ways. And there's proof of where he was on the days in question. And so I thought, you know, these, these conspiracy theories, they're kind of crazy. But it turned out that one of the uh, arguments that, the peop that people made on behalf of uh, there having been this really, um, you know, act of treason really um, by the Reagan campaign um, is it revolved around whether William Casey, who was the campaign manager and who later became head of the CIA and had been uh, number two at the OSS uh, during World War II, uh, an old spook, uh, whether he had gone from a conference in London in um, the summer of 1980, and everybody agrees he was at this conference, whether he had gone to Madrid to meet with some Iranians. And the debunkers of the October surprise thought they had established that he never went to Madrid. And that was their, the, the strength of their debunking case. Well, there's a, a journalist who used to be a colleague of mine named Robert Perry, who has since died. And he, a few years ago, came up with a document uh, from the uh, Bush Library. He got it out of the Bush Library of, um, a cable from the uh, US ambassador that had been suppressed and uh, taken from the files, but he has the document and I quoted in the book uh, saying, uh, Bill Casey's in town today in Madrid. Um, so we know he's in Madrid, but um, Gary Sick, who was Carter's White House aide on Iran and wrote a book about this. That's one of the reasons I didn't devote too much space to it. He believes that the CIA destroyed the hotel records and the other records that could nail down that this meeting actually took place. And so we'll never know for sure. But the evidence is, you know, at least suggestive that something happened. And then there are other things that happened after Reagan came in. We started allowing the Israelis to ship weapons to Iran, not in 1985, which is the, what it was in the Iran-Contra scandal, but in 1981, just a few months, a couple months after they re released the hostages. And so that sort of on its face kind of looks like a payoff for them having, uh, you know, not released them before the election. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, in my gut, I, I think there was that deal. Um, I don't know whether Reagan himself knew about it, but uh, I smell a rat. Well, uh, of course, he loses the election. It's a bitter, bitter disappointment to Jimmy Carter. And he's, he's depressed uh, afterwards, goes back to planes, kicks a few things around, and then eventually winds up um, raising some money with Rosalind, of course, and starting the Carter Center with, with not, not just a, a presidential library, but a really mission driven uh, organization and, and infrastructure to wage peace, fight disease, building hope, I think is, is the mission. And he's so consequential in this role as a negotiator, a democracy advocate, public health programs on the guinea worm, for example, agricultural uh, processes in Africa. He achieved so much when he was out of office, and, and, and uh, Rosalind as well, their efforts really changed the lives of millions of people. So, so is there any takeaway there of that, what you can get done with out of the glare of resistance and of public office? Yeah, and he, you know, he, he as I mentioned, he revolutionized the office of first lady, 
We haven't talked about how he revolutionized the vice presidency. He was the first president to give his vice president any real power. Remember, Roosevelt's vice president said it wasn't worth a bucket of warm spit, although he actually said piss and the newspaper <laughs> changed it to spit. And that's pretty much what the vice presidency was until Mondale. Uh, and then um, he revolutionized the post presidency. Mm -hmm. And really only John Quincy Adams and uh, you know, who went to Congress after he was president, William Howard Taft, who uh, became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Only they had, you know, big uh, post-presidential careers. Carter showed that you didn't have to regain office in order to really make a difference. So he set this new standard. But I wanted to correct this idea that he got more done as a former president. When you're a former president, as we're learning now with Trump, you don't have any power anymore. You know, you can, you can talk, you can write, by, you know, Carter wrote a lot of op-ed pieces and gave speeches and he got really great things done on guinea worm disease and some other diseases and, and he monitored elections. And in one year in particular, 1994, he had some success uh, as a peacemaker, but those achievements are, you know, with all due respect, and I think Carter agrees, they are not as world historical as the achievements uh, of when he was in office. And, um, you know, there are so many other things that he got done that we don't have time to talk about, but just, you know, really quickly, like Trump would not have been impeached the first time if it wasn't for the first whistleblower protections, the first inspector generals, the first FISA courts, all of which came in under Jimmy Carter. Um, and, you know, when you go for a beer, now that people can go out a little, you wouldn't be able to drink a craft beer tonight if it wasn't for Jimmy Carter. Uh, you know, they, they, de they deregulated. The, the big breweries used to have control over, uh, uh, you know, all brewing. And that changed. You wouldn't be able to fly any to another city for anywhere close to the low fare that you have today if it wasn't for airline deregulation, trucking deregulation. We could just go, which basically created the just-in-time supply system. He appoints Paul Volcker to be chairman of the Fed. Volcker ends inflation. Reagan gets credit for that, but it was a Carter appointee. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we've been living in this inflation-free uh, society for the, for the last nearly 40 years that's on Jimmy Carter's record. So what I was trying to do was not, you know, diminish the achievements of his post-presidency, but to put them in better perspective with his, his presidency and also to kind of chronicle how this epic American story, this, this really, um, this American classic really unfolded and how his life experiences uh, influenced him and then influenced the world eventually. Well, you, you were writing this book when Donald Trump was president and uh, Jimmy Carter witnessing all of this and you know a couple of things that are very current now. Um, he was vocal against the Carters. Jimmy Carter came out with a statement after SB 202 was passed here in Georgia, the voting um, voting restrictions, which he said, you know, it was Jim Crow 2.0. We were turning back the clock, I think was how he said it, and was really upset that his his own voting restrictions or or analysis of voting with James Baker was brought up as a case that voting by mail wasn't safe. And, um, and then also the response to the coronavirus, which was so different from Donald Trump than the, the kind of excessive preparation that he would have used. I'm just wondering for, you know, the Malay speech quote unquote Malay speech, when he was talking about America, uh, American greatness in the past tense and came under such criticism for that. Years later, Donald Trump is talking about American carnage and, and, and make America great again. How do these, you know, this is, just, is this just the political ebb and flow that these kind of standards can change so? You know, I, Virginia, I hadn't thought of that. That's a great point. I hadn't put the Malay speech in that context before. You're quite right. Um, so, um, you know, I, I have to say that uh, I, I don't think my feelings about President Trump are any secret, but I, I, I was 
in the Carter Library in Atlanta on the day that Trump came down the escalator mm -hmm. and announced his campaign in June of 2015. And I, uh, you know, I got a text from MSNBC, get over to a studio in Atlanta and you know, analyze, you know, what, what uh, Trump is doing. I, I thought his remarks were scary. He's talking about r Mexican rapists and all that kind of stuff. And I knew he was a demagogue. Um, and I remember getting back to the library and feeling like these Carter papers, um, they were sort of almost brushing away the toxins. And for the next, you know, five years, uh, I, I, I used, I was, you know, Jimmy Carter, uh, you basically have to get married to the subject of a biography. And, but I felt it was a vacation from Trump. It was an escape from Trump. And, and I, I hope reading the book is kind of, can give people some hope. Uh, um, but interestingly, Carter's attitude toward Trump changed over the course of my conversations with him and in a way that I think is revealing. So at first he wouldn't criticize Trump. I mean, he said he didn't, he, he said he wished he, he didn't lie as much, but he really w wasn't issuing the broadsides against him that he did against Democratic presidents. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, he, part of my book is about his very fraught relationship with Bill Clinton. And, you know, and he would be very critical of, of Obama as well. Um, and so I, you know, I kept wondering why. And then I realized that he was hoping that Trump would appoint him as a special envoy to North Korea because he had done that for Clinton and he had arguably prevented hostilities on the Korean Peninsula in 1994. Um, and um, Carter always wants, wanted until recently when he's, he's too old to do so, he wanted back in the action, you know? And then when it was clear that Trump himself was gonna go to North Korea, then Carter got more and more critical. Uh, and um, and yeah, I don't think that's entirely a coincidence. Um, and, uh, you know, said in the summer of, uh, of 2019 that um, he wasn't even a legitimate uh, president, that he hadn't been elected, uh, you know, properly, that there had been Russian interference and uh, other things that intruded on our election. Um, so, um, he had a lot of experience monitoring elections in more than a hundred countries. And um, he was, you know, understandably uh, really aggrieved and, and offended by this new Jim Crow. Um, and the first speech that he gave in the Georgia State Senate, which he didn't want advertised because he knew it would hurt him in his district in Sumter County was about what they called the 30 questions. And uh, the 30 questions were what um, an African-American would-be voter was asked by the registrar before they were allowed to vote. And of course, they were impossible to answer questions. Nobody could answer those 30 questions. And it was a way to prevent Black people from voting. And so, uh, you know, this has been a concern of his for a long time, and he, and he, you know, as he points out, it's not like there's a law that says you can't vote. It's impediments that are put up to make it harder to vote. And so, you know, limiting like Fulton County to I don't know what it is, one drop box or whatever, you know, it it's just a variation on the thirty questions. And um, and he understands that. And and I think it's. It's upsetting to him at the end of his life that we're we're still dealing with this. On the other hand, he was exhilarated by the runoff results. Um, so, um, you know, he's uh, he's going to be 97 this October, and uh, his mind is still very sharp. He's infirm in other ways, and after a fall, his his eyesight is not what it used to be. So I can't email with him anymore, nor can anybody. Um, and uh, he has a little trouble moving around. He was so vigorous 
well into his 90s. Um, but uh, his mind is very clear and he's on top of events. And he's, um, I think he's, um, you know, very eager for the country to have the reckoning on race that he and so many of his generation had. And he gives us some hope. He came around, certainly, after some work. So there's hope for all, everybody. Well, Jonathan, um, I... And we've definitely over time, I could speak with you for a very long time. There's so much richness in this book, so many stories. I wanna thank you so much for your time. Well, thanks for, thanks for having me. And um, if anybody uh, wants to um, send me their address to get a, um, a book label, you know, uh, one of these stickers that I sign and inscribe, uh, to put in their books. I'm, I'm happy to do that. My email is jalter at jonathanalter.com. Well, there you go. Jonathan Alter, thank you. And thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We do encourage you to support your local bookseller, Acapella Books, and purchase your copy of His Very Best at the link at the Atlanta History Center website or at acapellabooks.com. I'm just checking here. There's probably a message about that book plate. What I can do what I can do is I can send a cappella a bunch of the book plates there. Then you don't have to bother emailing with me. There you go. I'll arrange with a cappella. I'll send them a bunch of book plates so that when you, if you want the book and you get it from a cappella, you'll uh, get a signed copy. And Claire at the Atlanta History Center says we will include information on how to get the book plates in a follow up email that they send after this event. Let's see what else is coming up here at the uh, loads more stuff coming up at the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talks. In fact, next Monday, April 19th, Thomas Piper, filmmaker, director, and producer of Five, season, Five Seasons, The Gardens of Piet Odulf, will be the guest for the Georgia Perennial Plant Association and Cherokee Garden Library Talk. Those are always very popular. On Monday, April 26th, Elizabeth Nia Mayaro will talk about her book, I Am a Girl from Africa with the Great and Dangerous woman, Pat Mitchell. There's a full schedule and Zoom links at atlantahistorycenter.com. Happy anniversary to Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. Thank you again to Jonathan Alter and thank you all for being here this evening and supporting the Atlanta History Center. Good night.